Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Paul Markov. I'll be your host for this evening. Welcome to the January 2020 uh, meeting, uh, Recreational Astronomy Night meeting of the Toronto Centre RASC. Uh, this is my uh, first chance to say Happy New Year to you. I wasn't here at the last meeting. Uh, thank you for coming down tonight on a, on a cold and clear night. I know some folks are out there observing tonight instead of being here, but <laughs> what can you do? Um, this evening we have a uh, packed agenda with uh, four speakers instead of the usual three. Uh, that's because some of the speakers told me they're not going to use up their full half hour, so uh, I've added one extra speaker. And um, the people speaking are Arnold Brody, starting with the sky this month, followed by Artash Nath. Uh, he'll talk to us about pre predicting exoplanetary atmospheres using machine learning, um, the aerial telescope simulation. Uh, then Frank Dempsey will tell us about uh, his uh, stargazing travels in New Mexico. And finally, Ron McNaughton will talk to us about immersive astronomy. And of, of course, we'll have uh, uh, Ralph Chu, uh, our president, uh, deliver the um, announcements at the end of the meeting. Um, other than uh, introducing uh, the, uh, the speakers and, and hosting the meetings, I also search for speakers. So uh, if any of you uh, have a presentation in mind, please come see me after the meeting or contact me through email. Um, we do have one open slot available for the February meeting and forward, it's wide open for uh, presentations. Um, any new members here uh, or, or people here for the first time, members or not, a show of hands please. We'd like to see if we have some new folks here. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. And um, I think we're all set to go with our first presenter, Alna Brody, with uh, the sky this month. Sound okay? Excellent. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming and for watching from home as well tonight. I well, we've got a lot to a uh, lot of lot to talk about tonight. We've got. We've got uh, asteroids and planets and occultations and a comet and uh, some space mission updates. There's a lot of space to cover, so uh, let's get started. February gives us a very generous night window. It's as, as, as great as uh, 11 hours uh, at the beginning as of tomorrow night, and it's still a healthy nine and three quarter hours by the 26th of February. And, and that, those are the durations of night, and night is defined as the sun being 18 or degrees or more below the horizon. But you don't really have to wait till night uh, to do your observing. In fact, some observing is best done before night. Uh, the, uh, trying to decipher the phase of Venus, for example, is best done when you've got some uh, little bit of light in the sky still so that the contrast with Venus is not that severe and you can more easily identify the shape of the phase of Venus. Once the sun goes or deeper and it, the sky gets much darker, then the contrast is so great, Venus is just a blaze, and it's hard to, uh, to see its phase. The same would be true for uh, Mercury. Also, twilight is the best time for those of us learning the sky or trying to teach others the constellations of the sky because in twilight, when only the brighter stars are visible, the ones that we use to connect the dots to make the constellation shapes, well, those are the ones you'll be able to see and easily recognize the constellations before it gets much darker and all the smaller stars come out to fill the sky. Speaking of constellations, here's what the sky is going to look like tomorrow night. Uh, we've got <clears throat> the fall time constellations like Pegasus starting to drift off into the west. There we see Cygnus the Swan finally diving below the horizon. And it's from that point on, right across the sky, going right across the center of the sky, is the Orion Spur of the Milky Way. It's the next uh, arm away from, uh, looking away from the nucleus, we're looking out. <clears throat> and the Milky Way goes right across the sky, in fact it crosses the zenith, so it's well positioned for observing. And it's called the Orion Spur, which gives name to the Orion constellation. And of course, this is the time, best time of year to enjoy the winter constellations like Orion and Taurus, Riga, Perseus. They're all front and center, all ready for you to observe uh, to your heart's content. Of course, uh, in, the, in the east, we, be, we are starting to see the 
springtime constellation sneaking into view. In fact, here's the view at the end of this period on the 26th. And look how high Leo is at 8 o'clock in the evening. So by, by uh, this time next month, you can just as easily observe and take time studying the springtime constellations as well as uh, the winters are still here. So it's like the god Janus uh, looking in both directions. You can, you can enjoy the wintertime constellations as well as, as springtime. And uh, turning our attention to the sun, uh, it, it climbs about uh, nine degrees over this reporting period. Can I click that to make it run again? There we are. And it's that rise in, in altitude that is squeezing our night window down by an hour uh, the, over the next 28 days. And it's interesting, this is something I, I picked up while working on this slideshow, is it's possible to have solar disturbances from two consecutive solar cycles occurring at the same time during the minimum that would ordinarily separate the two. And here we see, whoops, don't do that. Here we see active region uh, AR 2757 here. Uh, a few days ago it was over here and it had a burst uh, of, of a little solar storm aimed our way with the particles arriving supposedly today. So I jumped online to see if there'd be any auroras and so on. No, there's no talk of auroras. Uh, from that, it's, and that's not to be, I mean, that's to be expected, I'm trying to say, because when the sun is at solar minimum, uh, any activities like that, any kind of flares, they really don't pack much of a punch. Meanwhile, we have a new active region rotating into view, and it has been identified as belonging to solar cycle 25. So we've got, uh, basically, uh, cycle 24 hasn't quite finished its flip. Yet, at the same time, some of the lines have completed their flip and now are participating in solar cycle 25. Uh, this did produce a, a sunspot. It didn't last for long, and uh, the officials at the NOAA were so unimpressed with this active region that they didn't even decide to give it a designation. And they have yet to announce the start of solar cycle 25, and they probably won't for quite a few months. Um, Sometime this spring, maybe in April, it'll be declared, but right now we're still at minimum in between the two. Here we see the solar Parker, the Parker Solar Probe orbiting and taking advantage of, of uh, uh, Venus. Uh, every once in a while, it has a chance to pass by Venus and transfer some of its orbital energy to Venus. It's getting a gravity, uh, what they call an, uh, a gravity assist, but it's actually a negative assist, if you will, losing some of its orbital energy so it can drop into a lower perihelion around the sun. In fact, it was earlier today, um, at 4.30 in the morning, our time, when the Parker probe did indeed pass on its fourth perihelion, the closest yet uh, to, to the sun. And uh, here we have some, whoops, here we go, here's some stats. Uh, this first perihelion that occurred, uh, the, the, it was at uh, 35.7 solar radii from the sun. But the one that happened today, earlier this morning, uh, this, it came within 26.7 solar radii. And the ultimate closest approach uh, is planned to be at under 10 solar radii, so that shows you how much closer it will be by the time uh, it gets as close as planned. It's going to take 24 orbits in total, and the whole mission is going to last the, almost seven years in total. And after just two passes of perihelion, uh, the scientists, uh, mission scientists on this project have learned a lot about the sun already. And I'm going to show you a, a little clip here uh, of five things uh, that have already been learned of, from the solar probe. Here are five features Parker saw. We've long known that space is full of cosmic dust. We can even see the dust from Earth because it reflects sunlight. Parker saw evidence that the dust stops at an estimated three and a half million miles from the sun. As the dust gets closer, the sun vaporizes it creating a dust-free zone surrounding the star. 
At Earth, it appears that the magnetic field lines flow evenly out from the Sun, but Parker saw them behave in a surprising way. The magnetic field lines flip in a whip-like motion, turning 180 degrees around in a matter of seconds. These switchbacks came in clusters and were timed with fast-moving clumps of plasma in the solar wind. Scientists have long wondered if the solar wind is generated as a continuous flow or in spurts. We now see evidence that the solar wind has rough, irregular texture. The plasma within it also seems to lack an orderly sense of direction. Some clumps of solar material fire out into space, while others fall back toward the sun. These clumps may be distorting the magnetic field, causing the switchbacks. They may also be an indicator of what the solar wind looks like in its early stages after its birth on the sun. Parker found a transition point in the solar wind. The corona is the sun's faint, outermost layer that transitions to the solar wind. Before Parker, scientists knew that the corona rotates with the visible surface below it, but they didn't know how, or where, the solar wind switched to flowing straight by the time it reaches Earth. Parker has finally spotted signs of this transition, and the changeover happens significantly farther out than expected. Although the sun has been very quiet over the first two orbits, Parker observes several tiny bursts of solar energetic particles. While these events have been seen before, never ones this small. The fast-moving particles from these modest bursts spread out as they move from the sun, making them undetectable from Earth. Without Parker's front row seat, we would never know that the sun is regularly producing these small-scale events. Fast-moving particles are a source of dangerous radiation. The more we learn about these eruptions, the better we can protect our technology and astronauts. Parker still has more work to do, but it's already helping us see our star in a whole new light. Okay, let's jump to the moon, shall we? And uh, for the next couple of weeks, the sky is going to be getting lighter and lighter as the moon approaches first quarter this weekend and becomes full the following. So our best opportunity for doing deep space and astrophotography might be starting, whoops, <laughs> did it again. There we go. Uh, the 15th, it'll be uh, last quarter. So from that point on, the last two weeks of February should be ideal for doing your deep space work. Um, on the upcoming slides, I'll talk about the moon occulting some stars as well as Mars in a couple of weeks. As far as observing the moon, we don't have a chance at the lunar X and V this month because while the sun is at the right angle to produce those, the moon will still be below the horizon. By the time it rises, the angle won't be right anymore. So not this month. Um, as far as libration, the southern limb of the moon will tilt in our direction, fortunately during full moon. Fortunately because that means that area of the moon will be illuminated and that'll give you an opportunity if you are interested in sketching or taking some photographs of these particular craters on the south limb that will be turned into our view best ever. And as far as apogee and perigee, uh, the full moon is February the 9th, or, well, that, that would be universal time. And it, it um, approaches perigee on the 10th, almost at the same time. It, it just misses being a full moon by a day, but the next three full moons will be super. Uh, and then apogee is uh, on the 26th. The difference between the two in distances causes this visual difference in size. Uh, the perigee, the, the moon will appear about 27, I, I'm sorry, 12.7% larger than at apogee. And now, occultations. We've got, you know, it's been a while since we've had a, a, the moon occult a bright star. Well, here, a week from tonight, you get to see it occult two stars. First, at uh, uh, Geminorum, which occurred at the beginning of this video, and that's around uh, 7.43 uh, on, on a week from tonight. And then four and a half hours later, Mu Geminorum slips behind the moon. So it's a rare opportunity to actually see the moon occult two bright stars on the same night. 
and of interest in particular is Eta Geminorum. Here we see the moon just about to approach it. And it's really a uh, binary or a multiple star system. The western component is a brilliant 3.28, quite bright. And the eastern component is uh, much dimmer at uh, only magnitude 6. But the interesting question is, when the moon gets there, will it first cover the western star and then the eastern star in a two-step occultation? Or will they both wink out together? I think that'll be very, very interesting to watch. And then on the 18th of March, the moon's going to cover up Mars. Now, it'll be daytime. Uh, in fact, around 7.25 in the morning, our time, when, the moon, uh, when, the, when Mars is up in the, in the daytime sky. But it will be bright. Uh, the moon will be bright enough, I think magnitude 1.5, something like that. Uh, you should be able to see it with a telescope, uh, even in the daytime. So what I would suggest you do is get out there around 6 o'clock in the morning, an hour before sunrise. If you have a motorized telescope, aim it at Mars and start tracking it. And then keep your eye at the eyepiece, and you should see the moon come over and come right over it around... Uh, around 7.25 our time here. Now, the further west you are, uh, I used the Ontario Science Centre for my uh, stats. So if you are uh, west of the Ontario Science Centre, like in Etobicoke, it'll occur earlier. Or if you're further west, like in Oshawa, it'll occur a little bit later. But you get the idea. You can definitely catch this one if we are fortunate enough to have clear skies. Now, on to the planets. Um, Mercury is going to reach greatest eastern elongation on the uh, 10th of uh, February. And at that point, it'll be uh, 18 degrees from the sun and under high magnification and uh, with a clear transparent sky, you might be able to see the Mercury perfectly half lit when it's at uh, greatest elongation at which time it'll be about 10 to 12 degrees above the horizon in the dusk in February on the 10th. So that'll be in a prime time to see if you can catch the phase of Mercury with your telescope at highest possible magnification. Try and do it before it gets really dark, like I said before, before the contrast becomes too strong. Venus is also east of the sun and will be a magnificent sight throughout the spring as it climbs ever higher. I believe it reaches its own eastern elongation on March 25th, about 55 nights from now. And as it's climbing, it's actually getting closer to us. And that's why on consecutive nights, it'll become brighter and brighter. Uh, for example, uh, here we have the 30th of January, magnitude four, negative 409, 15 arc seconds wide, almost three quarters illuminated. And then when we jump to the middle of February, it's gotten brighter to negative 416. And the size has grown from 15 to 17, even though the illumination has reduced. And then by the 26th of, uh, of February, it's, oh, it's as bright as negative 4.21 and gotten even bigger. And 64% illuminated, almost half lit. That's the way we hope to be able to see it in the sky with strong magnification. These uh, captures from Starry Night Pro were timed for 5.30 in the afternoon when the sky is not totally dark. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do is get out there before it gets really dark. That might improve your odds at seeing the phase of, of Venus. Mars, it rises about three hours before the sun uh, throughout the month of February, and it's really too small to see any detail at all. Uh, we're going to have to wait quite a few months uh, before we get a little bit underneath Mars from the sun's perspective and get us a, a, a good look. Of course, opposition is in October. We're looking forward to that. Uh, but in the meantime, Mars is not all that exciting, except for maybe the occultation on the 18th. Um, Asteroids. Uh, there are six asteroids that are going to uh, go through opposition in February. And of those six, here we see five of them uh, all passing through a Cancer. Uh, the green arrows identify the location and magnitude of those five asteroids when they are at opposition. The dates that you see here are uh, for the dates in February. They all end in 20 because that's 
8 p.m. Are, are showing you. So if you want to track these uh, asteroids, here's a good chart for five of them uh, that are all in the same vicinity, uh, all climbing through Cancer around the same time, so you have an opportunity to examine each of these, maybe do some drawings of, of, the, of the asteroid with neighboring stars and then draw it again a night or so later and you'll see which one has moved. A fun exercise. The sixth of these asteroids is uh, number 12, Victoria, and it's going to reach opposition, I believe, on the 16th of uh, February, and it's much further south, uh, down in Sextons. Jupiter, well, this uh, shows you th the uh, yellow line, uh, arrows are the movement of Earth and Jupiter uh, throughout the month of February. Jupiter rises just an hour and a half ahead of the sun at the beginning of this period, and by the end of uh, February, it's only about two and a half hours ahead of the sun. In fact, it's only 10 degrees up at the end of astronomical twilight, uh, at the end, uh, I'm sorry, at the end of night. So it's really in the murk. Uh, it's not gonna give you a, a good view. And for that reason, I decided uh, against showing you all the moon f um, phenomena like the shadow transits and so on because it's just down too low to enjoy. We're gonna have to wait till about May to get a good look at uh, at uh, Jupiter, and Saturn is even further east than Jupiter, so it's even in a worse situation, so we're gonna have to wait till the summertime to enjoy it. So in the meantime, I thought I'd show you this pretty picture of Saturn, how it will appear, courtesy of Starry Night Pro. And this is how it will look this summer, and for the first time in two years, we're gonna be able to see the southern limb of Saturn. It had been hidden by the rings, for the last two years, but now the ring plane is beginning to tilt towards us ever so slightly, so it's starting to get a little bit flatter, and we're gonna see a little bit more of the southern end of, of Saturn. Uh, it's gonna be a great treat in the summer, so we'll just have to wait. Uranus and Neptune, well, you can still catch Uranus. It's about 55 degrees high in this, in this graphic uh, uh, on the seven, at 7 p.m tomorrow, whoops, here we go. And Neptune, further down, that's more of a challenge, it's about 15 degrees above the horizon. But with strong magnification, you should be able to pick out the tiny little blue circle of Uranus, no problem at all. A bit more of a challenge to see Neptune. Uh, but if you catch it on a clear night, and if you have a good low horizon to the west, uh, you just might be able to pick out its ever smaller tiny blue dot. Venus has just passed Neptune. I believe it was at, uh, at uh, conjunction about two days ago. And Venus is on the way up, while Uranus and Neptune ice giants are on the way down. All right, Comet Panstars, C2017 T2. This is the path of Panstar uh, during this reporting period. It's taking a turn as it works its way from Perseus into Cassiopeia. And uh, apparently it's gotten as bright as 9.4. Uh, that was a report that was submitted to the um, Comet Observation Database. If you'd like to check that out, uh, here's the website for the Comet Observation Database. And there were three uh, there, there was a person who submitted a report last night pegging it at 9.4. Uh, and here's how it's going to pass across our sky uh, throughout the, uh, the remainder of winter and throughout the spring. We've got ringside seats because the comet is circumpolar throughout this period, so it's up all night. And uh, it won't actually cross out in, outside that circle until I believe the end of May or in, actually it's into June before it's no longer circumpolar. So we've got months to enjoy this uh, comet and predictions suggest that by the time it reaches perihelion, which is around the 4th of May, it should be magnitude eight, which would put it well within the uh, reach of, of any telescope, any pair of binoculars. And some optimistic reports suggest it could go as high as magnitude five, uh, but as David Levy taught us uh, comets are like cats. They both have tails and do precisely what they want. 
So we have to take magnitude estimates with a grain of comet dust. <laughs> but won't it be great at star parties or with school kids or whatever it is you're doing out under the sky to actually have a comet to show them? It's been such a while, and I'm really looking forward to enjoying that and sharing it with so many people at star parties this spring. Should be a lot of fun, it's been a while. And here's a picture that Claudio Oriani took uh, of that comet back in uh, early, uh, I think, it, uh, yes, uh, beginning of early January, January the 10th. And he used the Burke Gaffney Observatory in St. Mary's University. Uh, where they have a plane wave CDK24 robotic telescope available for your use. And Claudio did that. He had an exposure that lasted two minutes, and this is what he got. And I anticipate that we're going to enjoy at least that good of view in our telescopes this spring. And as it gets closer to the sun, hopefully that tail will grow out really beautifully. Meteor showers? Nope. Auroras, nope. But if you want, you can check these two websites out and keep an eye on things, uh, especially later this spring into the early summer when Solar Cycle 25 ought to be kicking in, and we might get a lot, a lot of uh, activity to enjoy. Uh, Starlink. Now here's your update for Starlink. Uh, back on January the sixth, uh, there was a launch. It was called the L2 launch, which is the third batch, because they started with zero, okay? And each of those launches had 60 satellites inside. And uh, as well, oh, oh dear, earlier today we had another launch, L3. That would be the fourth batch of 60 satellites to go up into space. So now there's 240 Starlinks going around the sky. And this is what it looks like in the uh, cargo compartment before they actually leave. Uh, there's 60 of them. And when they get pushed out, they don't actually have rockets to move away from. They just gradually drift apart because I believe they still have a bit of atmosphere at this altitude, which will cause the satellites to separate, and once they're far enough apart, ground control can then grab each one and fire them up into their proper orbits. One of the 60, in, this by the way is L0, but with the, L, um, with the L2 launch, one of those 60 satellites had the paint job to darken it. And uh, from what I read, it's gonna be a few more weeks before SpaceX tells us what they thought of that experiment. Hopefully it works. And another thing I learned is that if you don't propel these, these little satellites, if you leave them just to be, they will eventually orbital degrade in about five years and totally burn up in our atmosphere. Now that might be fun to watch. <laughs> I chose the 2nd of February on um, Heavens Above and said, what do we have in the way of L2? And here's what we got. These are all of the satellites that'll pass across our sky on the 2nd of February. Again, I took the Ontario Science Center as my location. So these are the ones that'll pass over the Ontario Science Center on that night. A total of 57 Starlinks and four Falcons are listed in here. I guess those would be either boosters or side boosters or something. I don't know what they are. Um, and uh, the, these passes occur from uh, a little bit before 6 p.m. all the way down to 9.20, by which time the sun is 20 degrees below the horizon, so we're truly into nighttime. Or oh, Ron, did you have a question? Third um, yeah, I think so. I'm not sure. Okay. I don't know what the third column is. Good question. Um, but what we do notice is their altitudes. Uh, where this is the altitude, maximum altitude, and they range from 12 degrees up to 70 something, 77 degrees. So in other words, these aren't exactly hugging the horizon, okay? And, it, and that's just the second. I mean, I chose the second out of random, but the thing is, that's happening tonight as well, and tomorrow night. 
and for a few more nights until I think it's the 6th of February when they start become daytime passes. And then by the 12th of February, they become pre-dawn passes. Uh, and that's just the L2 batch. I'm not sure to what extent L01 or 3 may also interfere with our sky, but uh, there are some satellites here, I think, that are designed for uh, northern Canada communications. So we're going to have these in our sky, at least for a while. Hopefully that paint job works in the future. There's more shuttle, I mean, there's more, more launches. These are not, that. this is just the start. I asked uh, Heavens Above to give me a graph of the path of the first in that list, and then I called up the graphs for the rem a few more and manually threw in onto this one the curves or lines that those other uh, passes will create. And after doing about 12 of them, I thought, that's enough. That gives us a good idea of what it might be like. I'd have to throw in about 40 more lines to do everything that was on that list. So it's going to be an interesting experience for us to, to come into terms with these things passing the sky. And apparently, they're quite bright, brighter than most satellites. Uh, how about the ISS, speaking of satellites? Uh, would you like to catch the satellite uh, passing in front of the sun, maybe watch it, maybe take a picture of it, or a video? Well, here's a path, a transit of the ISS in front of the sun, and the center line runs through the Durham region. In fact, you can see it up here in Midhurst, Barry. It works this way. It actually goes through the Glen Major Forest area, and I was trying to find a good access point where you could get off, and, but there's limited access around there. It's not easy, but I did find a really good spot down here in southern Whitby. Uh, it's right here. There's the center line passing right across the waterfront trail, just east of Forbes Street, just south of the OPG General Warehouse. You've got Plenty of parking. Looks like there's ample parking, so you won't have any trouble finding a spot to pull off. Uh, there's open field here where you can set up. I would suggest you bring a shovel in case you need to clear a, some, a square from snow. And this location is very close to the Thixon Road exit off the 401. So if you have to travel out to Durham to catch it, you'll have plenty of time because the transit is in 2.12 in the afternoon, so you've got plenty of time to get out there clear the snow, set up, catch the transit, grab a bite, and then go home because you'll be going against the traffic. It's nice and easy, right? You'll be heading back to Toronto. So you might actually be able to catch that one, and wouldn't it be fun at a future meeting if somebody showed us a picture they got of, of, of the ISS? It's doable. And happy Valentine's. Uh, Valentine's is this month. So I thought I would grab a few deep space objects that have maybe a Valentine's kind of connotation to it, uh, like the Heart Nebula. So let's start there. This is the Heart Nebula. And you may have already seen this picture before. Uh, we got a, uh, a bonus with this one because the mate, the Sol Nebula, is right next door. And uh, this is a uh, interesting picture that uh, Adrian Aberdeen uh, took and processed and put out on our forum, Special Interest Group on Astronomy. So if you visit that site, you'll find the details of what Adrian did to produce the image. But as you can see, he pushed the blue quite a lot. That's because it's his favorite color. <laughs> and But these two nebula actually glow predominantly in the red light of ionized hydrogen, that red color. And that's the way they would look in a typical photograph. And some have actually referred to the uh, Heart Nebula as the Running Man uh, or Running Dog Nebula, based on what components they were actually able to see in their telescope. So it goes by a number of different names. Uh, finding it is not too hard. It's just five degrees southeast of Seguin here. And there, that, can you see that shape? Can you see the heart shape there in the soul here? Uh, they're faintly visible in this graphic, and uh, so it's not a very big jump to find them. Just go to Seguin and then drift a little bit to the southeast, and you might pick them up. And you'll already be in this area if you're following pan stars, because that comet is going to slice right in between them uh, in late February, early March. You'll already be looking in this direction. Now, here's the next one in our list. It's Messier 50. 
the heart-shaped cluster. Can you see a heart shape in those stars there? Now, the difficulty here is that it's a photograph, so you've got a lot more stars, uh, the faint ones filling the field of view that you might not ordinarily see in a telescope. But I think I saw a few patterns that might be the heart. Uh, for example, there's one. Is that the heart? Or there's some other stars that could contribute. Maybe it's a bigger heart like that. But apparently, when you look at it through a telescope, uh, which stars give you that heart shape will be readily apparent. And it's a very interesting uh, cluster as well. And finding it is not so difficult. There's M50. It's in Monoceros, halfway between Alpha Monoceros and Beta Monoceros. And over here, we have the sword of uh, Orion, Orion's sword, and the reason I mention that is the distance from the sword to M50 is a little bit more than 20 degrees. Now, a fist held out at arm's length will cover 10 degrees of sky. So it should be possible to put two fists in between the, uh, the sword and M50. Let me try and demonstrate that here. So there's one fist, and there's your second fist, and that'll put you right close to M50. And if you're in that area, you can find bright stars on either side. That would be Alpha, Montes Herodes, and Beta. Draw a line between them. And M50 is right on that line. Just a little bit towards Beta from the center point. Just a little bit closer towards Beta. Now, this cluster was discovered by Charles Messier in 1772 while he was observing a comet in the neighborhood. This cluster uh, has about, it's about 3,000 light years away. It has about 500 members, totaling more than 285 solar masses. It's relatively young. Would you say 140 million years is relatively young? Well, let's just say it's 140 million years old, and it has a magnitude of 5.9, uh, so it's the brightest in our Valentine list and easy for you to catch. Third on our list is the Rosette Nebula, Caldwell 49. And uh, <clears throat> it's seen in this image here by Jeff Booth. It's a large spherical H2 region, circular in appearance. And uh, it's located in Monoceros region of the Milky Way. And NGC 2244, called Well 50, is this open cluster embedded right in the middle of the nebula. In fact, it was formed from material taken out of the nebula, and now these stars are so hot and fierce and blowing such strong winds that they've blown a hole in the nebula, allowing us to see them. This nebula and cluster lie about 5,000 light years away from us. And, and the remaining gas that hasn't fallen into stars yet apparently has enough to create 10,000 solar masses. Uh, that's a lot of bonbon chocolat. Um, by the way, to encourage others to try their hand at taking this image, Jeff would like you to know that he imaged this nebula from his backyard in light-polluted Oakville. So if he can do it, he's encouraging you to give it a try too. And to find the rosette, it's, it's relatively easy. We're going we're gonna to go from Betelgeuse to 13 Monocerotis and, and down. Let's just try that now. It's about nine and a half, I'm sorry, nine and a half degrees east of Betelgeuse. And then once you have your telescope on it, uh, just drift down a little bit, about two degrees, then you will come upon that. In fact, you'll probably see that cluster first. Uh, Oh, it is possible to see the Rosette Nebula as well as the cluster in your telescope, but what you're going to need are two things, very dark skies and a narrow band uh, nebula filter to dim down those stars while still allowing the light from the nebula to pass through. Speaking of that nebula, um, it's really a, a, an impressive nebula. It's very young at less than 5 million years old. Its brightest two members are fearsome O-class monsters. Remember, O is the hottest, most brilliant class of main sequence stars based on any, any jump cannon's classification scheme. 
One of those two O stars is so bright, it's 400,000 times brighter than our sun and 50 times more massive. To give you an idea, Betelgeuse is, I think, 11 times and Antares 12 times the mass of our sun. So when you're getting up into 50, you're talking very large. In fact, another one of those O stars is even nastier. It's 450,000 times brighter than our sun. 60 times its mass. And a star that's that massive doesn't live long. A 60 solar mass star will live for only 3 million years. And that puts an upper limit as to how old that cluster itself might be. So if you're looking for a supernova, if you're waiting for Betelgeuse to go, well, maybe one of these will go first. They're really massive stars. And in the foreground is 12 Montessorotis. It's not a cluster star. It's 500 light years from us, whereas this cluster in Nebula is 5,000 light years. So that's just a foreground star that you might notice. And last on our list, our final Valentine's treat is the merging pair of uh, galaxies, NGC 20, uh, 4038 and 4039, which together combine to give us what we call the antenna uh, galaxies. And that's because they're colliding and the gravitational tidal waves that it's producing is throwing out long streamers of stars and dust and gas and two long sweeping arcs that give it the appearance of insect antennae. Whereas the uh, spiral structures of the galaxies are now colliding and coming together to form the two lobed heart shape that we see here. And this coming together has triggered a tremendous amount of starburst. You can see very many active H2 regions and a lot of brand new bright stars along the perimeter of these spirals, one-time spirals. And the immense light causing these blue reflection nebula around the lobes of the heart. And uh, that luminosity of all the starburst activity has risen these two lobes to around magnitude 11. And that brings it within visual observing reach in dark skies with an eight inch or larger telescope. And we can use these top two stars here on the north wall of Corvus to help us find the antenna galaxies. We've got El Gorab and uh, Gienna. And if you draw an arrow or draw a line from El Gorab to Gienna, all right, and then let's continue that line for the same distance for the same length, and that'll bring you to within half a degree of the antenna galaxy. So hopefully that'll be good enough to help you find it. Okay. I'd like to quickly talk about two variable stars, Algol and Betelgeuse. As far as Algol is concerned, there it is on the western leg of Perseus. And that star has been uh, vilified over the uh, years, the ancient cultures. They refer to it by names such as uh, the demon star. We still refer to it that way. The head of Medusa, or Satan's head, or the specter's head in various cultures. And why all this uh, vilification? Why, why all this negative talk? Well, that's because the ancient astronomers, of course, well before telescopes, using their eyes alone, they were able to notice that Algol would drop in magnitude a lot, 75% actually, less than every three days or every three nights on that cycle. And you can actually watch it dim and down. But stars aren't supposed to do that. Stars are fixed. They're stable. They're permanent. They're forever. But not that one. Not that guy, that one's an outlaw. That one's bucking the rules. That one is challenging sacred order. Hence the negative terms. But today we know why, and it's because of the fact that it's actually two stars orbiting each other. It's a triple star system, but the, these two happen to orbit each other on our line of sight. So when the dimmer star comes in front of the bright one, we have that significant drop in light, the ones that the ancients were able to see. 
Now, when algol is at its brightest, it is equally as bright as ALMAC, or gamma Andromedae, very close by at a magnitude 2.1. But when algol is in mid-eclipse and at its dimmest, it's as dim as 3.4, which is the same as alpha triangulum, the uh, far star at the far corner of the triangle. This scene is for the 28th of February, so I did borrow into the next period. But I bring this to your attention because on that date, by 10 o'clock that evening, Algol will be at minimum. Now, it takes four hours for the eclipse to take it from its brightest to its minimum. It'll stay there for two and then another four hours to rebrighten. So if Algol is, being, is going to be at minimum at 10 in the evening, it will have already started. The eclipse will already be underway as the sky darkens that night. And here's a chart that shows you nearby stars and their magnitudes. So when Algol is at its brightest, at 2.1, it'll match Almac. When it's at its dimmest, it'll match Alpha Triangulae. And here we have star magnitudes in between those two. So as Algol is dimming, you have companion stars in the neighborhood to compare it to. Is it down to 2.81? Is it down further to 287? Maybe to 2.93? Maybe 331? Eventually it'll get down to 3.4. So you've got a chart here to, to, to help you do this. And if you ever wanted to get involved with an organization, let's say the American Association of Variable Star Observers and want to join one of their programs, chances are they'll ask you to cut your teeth with Algol as, as a uh, proof of concept and, and that you enjoy doing it and then move on. While you're in the neighborhood, Almac is a beautiful double star. Uh, so bring out your telescope and have a peek at it. It's well separated, easy to separate, and it will remind you, I guess, of Alberio with the two distinctive colors. Very pretty. And as far as Betelgeuse is concerned, uh, here's a light curve going all the way back to 1980. And as you can see here, Algol had a long history of fluctuating between 0.2 and 1. So it's 0.2 down to 1, then up to point two, then back down to, you know, it keeps going up and down in that range. Until last October when it started to go down to uh, point one and didn't stop, it continued to go down. All the way down to the most recent observation, 1.62. Will it stop and go back up or is it just going to continue, continue to drop? And if you would like to see for yourself if it's continuing to drop, here's a star chart that you can use with the magnitudes showing for neighboring stars. Now, this shows the traditional 0.43 that Betelgeuse would, has been in the past. And here's the 1.62 for Bellatrix that apparently it's equal to right now. So if we get a good clear night and you look at these two stars, apparently these two will look the same, but don't stare at them. The best way to uh, and, uh, judge magnitude of two stars is to go back and forth between them quickly. If you stare at a star, its magnitude tends to, in your, in your mind, tends to go up. So don't stare, just go quickly back and forth. Now, if a, a Betelgeuse does continue to go down, uh, the next stars that it might match in magnitude would be these two here in the belt at 168 and 171. So if you want to give it a try, uh, by all means, here you go. We've got a few more months before the sun takes over. We've got a few more months to enjoy uh, Orion. So here's an opportunity to see if it continues to dim. Here's some updates on uh, the, these manned shuttles or, or crewed shuttles as they intend to be. First, uh, on the 19th of January, the SpaceX had a totally successful in-flight test of their abort system. Uh, in which the Super Draco engines on the capsule ignite and rip it away from the ascent stage, from the ascent uh, launch vehicle. And then once it cuts off the engines and reaches uh, Apogee, it then jettisons its cargo compartment and opens out so the uh, parachutes are exposed. And then it did a soft 
landing in the ocean nine minutes after liftoff. It was a perfect test. Everything, they nailed it all. They nailed every step of it. And it was the final in-flight test needed before they start carrying astronauts. So they successful, successfully completed those tests. And here are the first two astronauts uh, that have been selected to go up into uh, the um, Dragon 2 to go up to the space station. Uh, these gentlemen have already flown on the shuttle, uh, so they have experience. Bob Benken and uh, Commander Doug Hurley on the right. In fact, it was his nephew that generated uh, that designed this this patch, which is kind of cool. Uh, speculation is they may go up in April. We haven't heard an announcement yet, but. Uh, some suggest that it could be as early as April that they go up there. And originally it was designed to be a 14-day uh, visit and go home. But NASA is now consider, considering extending it into a full uh, shuttle uh, transfer, like a, a four- to six-month stay. So this could become an actual uh, proper uh, crew, part of a standard crew rotation. Uh, we haven't heard the final word yet. And uh, the Boeing Starliner, it attempted to do its orbital test and go up and dock with the space station. And the liftoff on December 20th started off okay, but when the second stage separated from the first stage, one of the onboard clocks thought the mission was 11 hours old. Well, if we're 11 hours into the mission, we're well into orbit, aren't we? There's really no need to turn on the stage two engines, are there? So it didn't. Meanwhile, other onboard computers uh, noticed that the attitude, the orientation of the capsule wasn't right, so they started to burn the thrusters to maintain proper attitude. Not altitude, attitude. And because they were still in the atmosphere, it continued to move, so they had to continue to use the thrusters. And by the time ground control realized what was going on, by the time they finally got the stage two thrusters to take off and insert the capsule into orbit, they had consumed so much fuel that it was no longer safe to attempt a rendezvous with the space station. So they cut the mission short down to two days, uh, did a successful soft landing in the White Sands of New Mexico, and it's yet to be determined if they can now take crew. Had this been successful, they were anticipating a crewed flight in the summer, but it's now uncertain as to whether or not that's gonna happen. Uh, the, whoops. Trying to well, there was a press conference in which uh, the NASA administrators said that they have yet to determine whether or not a second uh, um, orbital flight is going to be required. So we don't know yet. And <laughs> now this is Boeing. Oh, did they? Well, it's egg in their face uh, because the Office of the Inspector General came out with a report um, in which he said that the average seat cost uh, on the Boeing Starliner would be 90 million compared to only 55 million for the uh, SpaceX Dragon 2. Uh, and that put Boeing on the defensive, of course. They uh, said that, well, maybe the calculations the Inspector General did weren't quite right. And then they justified the frequent times they've gone back to NASA asking for more money, uh, which SpaceX said, we didn't have to do that. But Boeing said, well, we needed to do that in order to improve our reliability and flexibility and blah, 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 blah. Basically, they had NASA on a barrel because NASA wants to have an option. They need two. And Boeing, I think, took advantage of that. And I'll finish my talk here with a close-up view of asteroid Bennu, where the Osi OSIRIS-REx spacecraft is currently in orbit and took these views, uh, looking for a safe landing site. And this is the one they've chosen. Uh, this, is go this goes by the name of uh, Nightingale, and it's their primary target. Uh, currently, they're practicing maneuvers, you know, taking flybys, seeing how low they can get, and so on. They're just practicing swooping around it. Uh, 
in anticipation of eventually uh, coming down for a touch and go sample grab in, in August. And then it will uh, hang out at the, com at the asteroid in, in March of 2021. Uh, It'll start its two year journey back to Earth to, with this precious cargo. So that, I believe, is a wrap. Does anybody have uh, any questions? Thank you. Okay. Oh, there we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arnold. That was a fabulous presentation. Lots to see. So few clear nights. Well, I mean, you've got those occupations <laughs> Absolutely, there's lots to see. Let's get our next speaker ready. Uh, Artash Nath is making his way down. He'll talk to us about reptiles. Let me grab the clicker. <laughs> Thank you. Oh.
Hi everyone, good evening, or rather by this time, good night. My name is Artash. Thank you for letting me speak here today. Today, I'm going to be talking about using hybrid machine learning models to remove noise from exoplanetary observations using data, using, sorry, using simulated data from the Aerial Space Telescope. So, first off, you may have noticed I said simulated data, not real data. This is because the Aerial Space Mission will be launched in 2028. It's a medium-class mission by the European Space Agency in collaboration with NASA. In its four-year mission, it'll observe over a thousand exoplanets. Now, enough about the Aerial Telescope. You might have remembered two years ago at the Carr Astronomical Observatory open house, Dr. Sara Seeger came and gave a presentation about the TESS Space Telescope. She talked about how the TESS was going to observe exoplanet, bright, bright, ex, sorry, exoplanets around bright stars in the proximity of Earth. This is actually very similar to what the Aerial Space Telescope will be doing. So to detect exoplanets around stars, the TESS Telescope stares at the star. And when the planet passes in front of the star, the the brightness of the star will dip and form a light curve. And that is how we detect an exoplanet. But how is the aerial telescope different? We have many missions similar to tests to observe exoplanets. There's the retired Kepler telescope, the, tel the test telescope, the retired Kepler telescope, but this is gonna be different because these telescopes have more been wide-scale observations. So for example, the test was gonna observe the whole 360 degrees of view, so have a very large-scale survey. But the aerial telescope will specifically measure different stars that have already been planned out and do further analytics on those stars. So another difference about this telescope is that previous telescope used to measure in one wavelength or a couple of different wavelengths. But the Aerial Space Telescope will measure the dip in light for those stars in 55 different wavelengths. How is this helpful? Well, let's say we're observing the exoplanet in two different wavelengths. In the first wavelength, the atmosphere of the exoplanet is absorbing all of this wavelength. So this is an additional blockage of light coming from the star. So the dip in light that we observe will be deeper or have more depth than it, act the rate that it actually is. Now, if we look at a second wavelength, in which case the atmosphere of the planet is actually letting the wavelength pass through. So in this case, there won't be as much light that's being blocked off from the star. So the depth of the light curve will be slightly less. So in these two cases, if we try to measure the radius of the exoplanet, we'll have two different sizes. How can this be useful? Well, with 50 for five different wavelengths, we're able to find which wavelengths are being absorbed by the exoplanet atmosphere and which wavelengths are being passed through the exoplanet atmosphere. This can help us find the actual elements in the exoplanet atmosphere. Sorry, um, but there's one problem with this. When observing the star, there are also several stellar spots on the surface of the star. And this can cause interference when you observe the light curves in all the 55 different wavelengths. For example, here in this graph, you see a light dip, but there's several small bumps that are also there that are basically created by stellar spots. And this can stop us from accurately observing the dip dip in all the 55 different wavelengths. So we have to solve this problem. That's why I decided to turn to machine learning. Machine learning is very good at analyzing patterns in large amounts of data. And here in the aerial space mission, they have provided a simulated data set of over 120,000 different exoplanet observations in all the 55 different wavelengths. 
So first we have the time series data, so data that follows an order here as a three-dimensional array for 146,000 observations. But we also have numerical data, so data that doesn't have an order. This is data such as the temperature of the star or the brightness of the star that we are observing. And this can help us find more about the star and help us accurately remove the noise caused by the stellar spots. And as an outcome, we need to predict the star to planet radius ratio for each of these different wavelengths. And basically this is the same thing as the depth of the dip in light created by the exoplanet going across the star. But I realized since we have, we have two data sets, I can't use just one machine learning algorithm for both the data types. So for the time series data, I would have to use a model that can analyze time series data. So I decided to use LSDM neural networks. This is a type of recurring neural network and can analyze patterns in time series data. So it learns in the light curve which are the areas that are more important to learn and which ones are less important to learn. For example, in the dip of light, it might it learn that the important parts might be the beginning, the end, and the middle. Now, for the numerical data, the data that doesn't fall in order, we need to use a different kind of machine learning algorithm. So I decided to use a feed-forward neural network, which is a neural network that is capable of analyzing patterns in non-time series data. And this is a slightly simpler neural network. So the f I made two different models. The first model would only look at the dips in light in the 55 different wavelengths for the planet. So this is kind of like a baseline model that I created when, until, when I used the whole data set. So this would pass the three-dimensional array through three LSTM layers. So again, encoding different and more complex levels of patterns inside the data. This will then be connected to a dense layer which will output the 55 different radius ra radi planets that are radius ratios for all the 55 different wavelengths. Now, this only used a part of the data and so was not actually um, accomplishing its full potential. So, the new neural network that I made used both the data types. So, the light curve data as well as the star parameters, so the star temperature or brightness. So the light curve data was passed through two LSTM layers, and the numerical data was passed through two dense layers. Then these two submodels were merged into one model through a concatenate layer, and then passed through a dense layer to get the final output. So once again, the 55 different radius ratio values. So I trained both of these neural networks on the data set over the period of a couple hours. And so here the red line is the hybrid model, so the model that used the full data, and the blue line is the one that only used the light curve data. So you can see that the hybrid model reaches a much lower loss. So in this case, it's better to have a lower loss, unlike in accuracy. So and it's also much more stable. So the blue line is shaking a lot, so it has a lot of disturbances inside it, so it's not constantly learning about the data, unlike the red line. So now I took this model and then actually applied it to values in the test data set. So in this case, the blue line represents the actual radius ratios for each of the 55 different wavelengths. So on the x-axis, you see the 55 different wavelengths, and on the y-axis, the amount of dip for each of the wavelengths. So the model, as you can see here, is able to get a pretty accurate result, so a value that is very close to the actual results. So in conclusion, my model is able to get a mean squared error on the data of 0.001 on the test data set, and it also works on two different data types, so the time series data as well as the numerical data. 
So it's a very customizable model. So if we have more data that we want to use from the, uh, the observations, then we can easily add it into the model and retrain it. So now that my machine learning model can predict the dip in light accurately for each of the 55 different wavelengths, how can we actually get the composition of the atmosphere of the exoplanet? So on the left, you can see the 55 different wavelengths on this side, as well as the dip in light on the y-axis. Now, from this, we can actually get the elements or the amount of elements of, for example, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, water, methane on, for each planet. So here you can see CH4, we're getting a different value from, for example, P cloud, which is a much higher value. And this is basically the final result that we want to get. So once this telescope actually launches, then if we apply this machine learning model to the data that it collects, we can actually approximate what are the levels of different compounds in the atmosphere of exoplanets. Um, so actually, this all these data sets were part of the aerial challenge, the aerial data challenge, and. I was one of the winners of the challenge, so I was invited to, pre uh, to present the research and the model that I created at the Aerial Open Community and Science Conference in Netherlands. So here you can see the schedule of the conference. And this is not the end though, because there are many ways we can still contribute to the aerial mission, even though Canada is not actually a part of it. The Aerial Space Telescope has launched an open source project. Because when the aerial telescope actually gets launched in 2028, we want to already know exactly where are these, are these stars and when are the exoplanets gonna transit these stars because that's the point where we actually wanna make our predictions. So this initiative, it has an app that you can download and it's for any um, um, astronomers that want to join and they will be given stars that they want you to observe. And you can note, that you can note when the, the brightness starts decreasing, so when is the exoplanet passing in front of it, and send this data back to the aerial mission team. And anyone with a small observatory or small tel or medium-sized telescope can actually participate. And this would actually be a, a great project for the RASC Robotic Telescope. Now, this is a very interesting project, I think. So many people would probably want to keep going with it or follow and, or make their own model to make these predictions. So I made a training module. So anyone can download the training model and it'll walk you through the whole data set and how you can construct your own model to solve the challenge. So this will help expand the knowledge of people know on the Aerial Space Telescope and I would be happy to conduct a workshop for any, any classroom or anyone who's interested. <laughs> I actually gave a similar workshop at the MIT Media Lab a couple months back, and it was a success. Everyone was able to participate and make their own models. So I think that um, this training model is actually very useful. You can find the link on my GitHub. So my code is rtashn. And thank you. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Please go ahead. Um, hi. Okay. Uh, thanks. It was really interesting. And I did watch some of your stuff that was available. Thank you. Um, did you? Uh, did you do some Python programming yourself and used uh, MATLAB or something like that as well? Is that one of that? I don't know. I didn't look at that. Yes, you're correct, actually. I did use Python to program my model. So I specifically used TensorFlow, which is an open source AI library for um, AI in Python. So it's very useful. Yes? Um, I guess my question is could be phrased two ways. Um, how generally useful is your hybrid machine model, or I guess the flip side would be, 
how many data sets look like that aerial data set that then you could put your hybrid learning model to analyzing? Yes. So first off, the data set that's trained the model is simulated. So it tries to emulate the conditions that we will see generally for exoplanets as the conditions applied, so um, brighter stars closer to us, because as the star is farther to us, it's ha even harder to distinguish the exoplanet that's passing in front of the star, because in the, ra in the ratios, it'll be even farther from us. But otherwise, it's close to the real truth values that actually happen around us. And so yes, it could be applied um, accurately to a more general range. And also, most telescopes don't have 55 wavelengths of light curves that they can observe for each star. So, but this model can also be retrained with either less wavelengths or perhaps more wavelengths if we add them. So it's very customizable, can be applied to most of the observations. Any more questions? Uh, yeah, just about the, uh, like, I guess the time series component of the model. So is that actually what you're using to predict the light curve over time with the LSTMs? Uh, the light curves, yes. So if I go back to the original data. Yes, so we have the two data sets. So we have, as I said, both the light curve data set, so data set with the light curves for each of the 55 wavelengths during the observation, as well as the star parameters. So we're using both of these data sets in the hybrid model to compute our final value. So that's the model that achieved a higher accuracy than the one that just used the wavelength data. That answers your question. Okay, so you're predicting every wavelength for every for every point wave. in time. Okay, yes. cool. But the model runs through all of them um, together because they're also related since they're part of the same exoplanet. Thank you. Very good. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you, Artash. Absolutely amazing. Well done. Okay, stopwatch. Okay, so there you have the title of my talk. So all I'm talking about is some um, travels in the state of New Mexico for looking at the sky visually. And so I decided years ago that visually, looking at the natural dark starry sky was one component of amateur astronomy that I really, really live for. So that's uh, all I'm, uh, I, I uh, mentioned to Paul, this might be one possible talk, talk uh, subject. He said, sure, try it. So. Let's uh, see if we can try the right button.
So uh, just to back up, I threw in a couple of astrophotos, but it's really useless because you can pick out uh, Orion there and some other constellations, but they don't do justice. In fact, no photographs I've seen anywhere do any justice at all to um, the actual real sight of a starry, unpolluted night sky, just brilliant with stars and Milky Way. So that's really my... Um, um, theme that I'll be trying to describe visually since I can't really do it photographically. So the only uh, images I've seen that come anywhere near approaching it are artists' conceptions. So I just have a few photographs just to um, decorate an otherwise blank screen, but I sure didn't come here to show off any photographs. So um, here's an outline of what I'll be doing for the past 10 years. I um, um, had a first visit and then had a last visit last year and in between, I'll mention a few little details. So that's all I've uh, tried to put together for um, a few minutes here. And so um, just for orientation, uh, where is the state of New Mexico? Well, that's west of Texas. I guess we have a pointer here somewhere. State of Texas. So it's west of Texas. It's east of Arizona, south of Colorado, and it's north of Old Mexico. Uh, so a couple of spots I'll point out. You may have heard of this already. You may have heard um, um Arnold mentioned the White Sands Missile Range where um, an unexpected uh, capsule came down there recently. And um, first spot I'll be talking about will be um, just east of Alamog Alamogordo. And so it's one of the towns sort of in New Mexico. There are two major cities, if you call it major, Albuquerque and Santa Fe. And if you want to go to where spots I've been going, you'd start off at El Paso, Texas, which is right here. So uh, just for a bit of orientation. But I have a couple of other charts. Uh, the other two points I'll be talking about will be Silver City and the spot up here called Cosmic Campground. So that's just some orientation. And you may have heard of some other spots. You may have heard of Roswell, New Mexico, and um, Route 66 across the north part of the state. But anyway, a uh, beautiful state, in my opinion, to visit. And so I've been visiting it for the past 10 years. So here's the reason. Um, so you, you may have seen these light pollution maps that became, have become uh, publicized in the past few years. And um, no real color scale, but the uh, uh, arrow marks off the um, spurt of, uh, part of uh, southern New Mexico state where um, I've been going. And so um, one spot that I'll mention is called, uh, was called and is called New Mexico Skies. And so it's a company that's right about here approximately, up in the mountains north and east of Alamogordo. And the spot where I've been going is here, and a place called Cosmic Campground, I'll point out, is up in the northern part of us here. There's a few other spots in um, western USA that are accessible and pretty dark. I've been to some spots in southern state of Utah and a few others. Some spots are not really um, easily accessible. You know, I've seen Rocky Mountains down here. and. Um, some forest area and so on, but like, uh, this spot is, uh, I've decided it's a really nice spot to visit and I'll try to communicate to you why. Um, so you have a bigger chart here and um, I think I mentioned um, uh, New Mexico skies is um, just past this uh, town called Cloudcroft, which is on crest of the mountains and then near Mayhill. Um, and then um, other spots will be uh, further to the west, but Let's just have a quick look at this uh, spot called New Mexico Skies. I should ask, anybody heard of New Mexico Skies? If you have, good, I can hear you, but I can't see you because of lights in my eyes. But uh, this is an image from approximately 10 years ago when they were promoting uh, amateur astronomers to come and visit their location because they had cabins for rent. So you could go, it was basically a bed and breakfast for amateur astronomers. That's what they were promoting. So this is an old image. It's about 10 years old or more. Um, just illustrating the reason why I went the first time. Uh, so I went for a few years. And so um, just a few more images of what's going on here. I mentioned uh, that they were um, inviting people to come and stay at their um, uh, accommodations for uh, several nights and use the telescopes or bring their own. Um, here's um, the cabin where I stayed at the first few years. and. Um, tiny little cabin and I think it was a one bedroom thing and had a kitchen and um, a bathroom and so on but good little spot here to uh, set up a telescope on a driveway or else they had another uh, area where you could set up a telescope and leave it for a few days if you wanted to um, with electrical supply. Um, so that's the cabin uh, I stayed at and um, here's another part of their property as it was about 10 years ago when I took these pictures. So you see numerous observatories that were all in use for uh, various groups or people around the world somewhere that operated them remotely. 
Um, they're also for their own use for, and for their own guests that would come. So they wanted guests to come and rent their telescope. So I did once, I rented their, I think it was six inch binoculars I used one time when I was there. Um, but they had uh, various uh, buildings, um, platforms for observatories, huge observatory here, roll off roof shed, roll off roof that would uncover quite a number of telescopes inside and they're building more. And so more are being built, uh, not here, but um, here you see more under construction. And this was about 10 years ago. Um, so I went for a few years and then I stopped going there because they stopped, um, they stopped the business of making it available for guests to come and stay as a bed and breakfast sort of thing. And that's because they converted over to access for remote observatory use. So um, all of those facilities you saw are now being promoted for the big business of um, uh, remote observatories. So people no longer stay there. They no longer want people to come and stay there. Their new business model became um, um, providing access to astronomers anywhere in the world that want to set up the telescope or access them. So it's quite busy that way. So that's fine, except I used to like going there. Um, okay, so um, uh, a few years after that, uh, a few uh, scenery images. So I didn't come here to talk about scenery, but I'll point out a few little details here. And uh, one is the blue skies. You know, there's quite a lot of blue skies in the few images I put in here. The other thing is this was. Um, about 10 years ago, you see full cutoff lighting. And so now in the past, maybe five years, it's become fairly popular for a lot of towns and cities to install full cutoff lighting, especially with the invention of um, LED lighting for street lighting. So they've, except in Toronto, of course, um, they've uh, cut out uh, cobra headlights and the incandescent high sodium lamps that were are in use in Toronto. Um, so the point here is that a um, long time ago, um, Arizona and New Mexico had dark skies because of uh, good lighting along the highway here. So that's the purpose of this uh, illustration. Uh, I mentioned a lot of scenery and um, a lot of blue skies in the images that you see here. Um, uh, I should mention one other reason that drew me to the place is one other another detail that I really, really like is walking in the mountains. So I didn't come here to talk about hiking. Uh, I just thought I should mention one little detail here. You see some blue sky in the picture to the left. Um, one of the hiking trails was, um, I put in this picture on the right, um, sort of, it's not always, every time I go there in winter, it's not always clear blue sky. It can be blizzard. So got to be prepared for that. In fact, when I was there a year ago, uh, they had a deep freeze and so had some uh, few centimeters or several inches of, as they call it, of snow on the ground um, in a spot that otherwise doesn't, doesn't get snow very often. And it was a deep freeze, and one morning the temperature was around approximately minus 12, minus 15 Celsius. Um, it was a morning when I had been out at a location I'll be showing you. Um, it might, so minus 15, no problem. So you go there prepared with you know coat and winter gear and so on. So standing outside for a few hours, you'd, you'd be prepared for that. And that's fine with me, but for those people there, it was quite a deep freeze, and the motel where I stayed at had uh, frozen pipes. Um, all the plumbers in town were busy scrambling, trying to refix all the uh, broken pipes in all the motels in town. So it was quite a uh, unusually deep freeze about a year ago there. Um, one other detail I could mention here is because today is one particular day. Um, it's called uh, today. Um, uh, anybody here want to say what uh, today's connection is with mental health? So it's, uh, yeah, it's Bell, uh, what was the word again? Bell, um, Bell, let's talk day. Coincidentally, today's Bell, let's talk day. So the idea of that is to promote mental health and remove a stigma ab about mental health. So I sure didn't come here to talk about mental health. I don't really know much about it, pay much attention to it or anything, except uh, to mention that um, it just does remind me that um, both walking in the mountains and standing under a really, really dark, natural, clear, brilliant, sparkling sky, um, I decided years ago were good for uh, one component of health that I call spiritual health. So I didn't come here to talk about spiritual health either, but it's that connection to mental health uh, today. So coincidentally, so I'm just mentioning that in passing. Um, anyway, uh, I mentioned hiking trails. I mentioned uh, it's not always a clear blue sky there. Um, there's some cloud there you see, but uh, so anyway, um, after I stopped going to New Mexico skies, I'd heard of this other place called the Cosmic Campground. Anybody heard of that? No, it's not really well known, uh, but there were some there was some noise made about it a few years ago. 
probably five years ago or more when it uh, was built and opened up. Um, the actual noise about it was there was some a little bit of excitement about it, and I gravitated to it because I was a time when I stopped going to this place called New Mexico Skies, and I was wondering where else could I go in this nice state that I basically fell in love with going to visit for its dark skies. Um, I heard about this place called Cosmic Campground. The actual noise about it was um, there were a few reviews about it. This is a good five years ago or more. Um, they weren't good reviews at all because somebody would say they, they went there and they stayed for a night or two and Yahoo's and pickup trucks came along to discourage them from, st from camping there. And um, Yeah, that's easy to believe. I have no problem believing that. Anyway, here's a view from the highway when you turn in. So um, I think I showed you a map. I may have another map. Oh, here it is here. So the um, point here is um, one way of going there is uh, to uh, El Paso Airport, closest airport. The other major airport is uh, Phoenix, where I went last year. Um, yeah, the only real disadvantage of this particular hobby is huge carbon footprint. And if you don't mind that too much, just for stargazing and hiking, then uh, I'll put up with that. But basically leave um, uh, El Paso and get to this, this place called Silver City, which I may mention a bit more about. Um, drive up the road here to the Cosmic Campground. So I drove there. Uh, the first year I went there from El Paso, and I gravitated to Silver City because it has, um, it has a, uh, a campground, the um, a KOA campground, which is open year-round. So it might have been January or February, and so... Fine for me for camping, uh, do some camping. So I went there and drove from this place called Silver City up toward the Cosmic Campground. Uh, s another spot, I don't think Arnold mentioned it, uh, this place called uh, Truth or Consequences. He mentioned the um, White Sands Missile Range where uh, a capsule made an unexpected landing. Um, it, I don't think Arnold mentioned it, but there's uh, another, another spot here, a huge, gigantic runway built onto the desert. Anybody know what that is? Uh, so it's called uh, Virgin Galactic Spaceport USA. Uh, so it's a gigantic runway on the desert. Anyway, um, uh, let's get back on track here. Uh, so you drive into the, into the Cosmic Campground. It's part of the National Forest. So you see a sign saying uh, Gila National Forest Cosmic Campground. That's how you know it's you're at the Cosmic Campground. I've only gone there a few times. Um, um, on my own, um, when a you know, weekday or sort of thing, that I, if I go for a week, and I go in the middle of the week, then there's nobody else there, and it might be a bit different on the weekends. As far as I know, it's it's a gravitation point for um, public star parties of sorts, similar to the CAO might be, although it's far out of the way. It does seem to be used for that purpose for some public education events, but. When I've gone there, it's quite deserted, and I just have a few pictures to give you some idea what's going on. Um, so I, I set up their um, car, one a little telescope I have there. You can see. I, I think I have another picture of it later, but uh, telescope, and it's quite barren, and it's quite a wide open horizon mostly, and it's quite a lot of scrubland. So that's desert, and that's New Mexico. So fine, um, and you see again some blue sky there. Um, and so they have these pads that they built for people to come in, unload their telescope gear, set them up on the pads, just like you'd see at CAO or some other spots. Um, and that's basically the extent, extent of the Cosmic Campground. So it's fine. Um, it's a great place to go, and you can camp all you want and set up the telescopes. Um, I guess that's how it's used. I'm not aware of any big use for it, but I haven't really been there except for, um, as I mentioned, uh, on, on my own in the middle of the week, when that's, uh, and especially in winter when I'm the only one there. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, so a road comes back out to the highway and leaving Cosmic Campground. That's the picture. That's the point that I'm trying to make in this picture. Um, so I think that's all I s mentioned there. Um, so um, one reason that I've been um, attracted to this place called Silver City is because um, I found it was a good place to hang around, camp the first year. Um, then I found there were some good motels at a reasonable price there. So I started staying, staying at motels. Um, and I noticed, uh, I like to go to uh, hiking trails, so hiking trails in all directions, and this is a Gila National Forest, and great spots for hiking in the mountains, and so on the way up to one um, spot, I passed, I drove past this spot on uh, one day, and thought, hey, that's a pretty neat looking lookout spot, um, well above the highway, and that's a really neat spot, and it's only an hour from Silver City. I thought it probably would be a nice uh, nighttime observation spot. And so uh, it turned out that it is. 
And so um, here's this place called Aldo Leopold Wilderness Lookout Area. And you may not have heard about uh, heard of um, Aldo Leopold. He was an educator and wilderness educator um, earlier part of last century. So quite a while ago, and he either set up or had this uh, facility named after him. But it's really um, it's really a drive-in parking lot and some picnic shelters set up. That's basically what it is. Uh, so um, it's ideal at night. Um, go there in the evening and there's really nobody there, especially in January or February, which is when I've gone. Um, um, might be a bit busier in weekends, I don't know. Might be a bit busier in springtime. Might be some venue for uh, public stargazing events. I don't know, I haven't been there then. But uh, the times I've gone, um, it's um, a big wide open area. You know, there's some trees and bushes around that block view of a perfect horizon otherwise um, it's quite a good spot for setting up um, just in the parking lot so that's what I've been doing so I've been doing that for the past five years or more I haven't really tried to keep count of how many years I've gone there um, so I think I just have a couple of images of this spot to, to finish off and uh, a plaque is set up to just uh, give some idea and so it just says um, USDA Forest Service Healy National Forest and um, Thanks, Aldo Leopold, for setting up this wilderness and uh, providing this educational sort of um, facility. That's what it was. So I found it to be pretty good for um, stargazing. So that's really the uh, last point that I mentioned about my travels in New Mexico. I've decided in the past few years, this is really the ideal, perfect spot that I found to go to. The only imperfection might be the financial cost and the carbon footprint of going there for a week. Um, you know, I rent an uh, um, airline flight. Uh, accommodation and car rental um, cost over a thousand dollars if I go for about a week or so but anyway um, it's uh, the most ideal spot I've settled on for going to see uh, dark starry really unpolluted uh, spectacular night skies so I think that's uh, about most of the images I set up to show you um, Oh, I, I, I titled this one lines across the sky so I uh, didn't want to say anything negative here but uh, Arnold already did, so Arnold, <laughs> I think Arnold's words were, oh dear, about the uh, Sterling, so I didn't want to um, say anything negative, but um, um, these are um, 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 air, uh, a snapshot of um, one screen of um, aircraft, um, uh, what's the word, uh, aircraft positions, you could say, and so uh, another map has, you look at um, any particular airline, if you've got lines coming across to the major airports, but you can pick out major airports here. You can pick out uh, south end of Nevada here. Here's a city called Las Vegas and a city called Salt Lake City and El Paso, Texas is down here. So the main point of this picture is um, southern New Mexico is right here. So you see this square marking off the state of New Mexico. So southern New Mexico is right here. So it's relatively unpolluted um, by uh, these lines crossing the sky at night. There are some, I have seen some across the southern sky. So it could well be this uh, particular flight path here. but um, do you stand there at 3 in the morning and see some aircraft so it's not totally um, natural or free from um, aircraft, but it is pretty darn nice, both at um, um, both at the Cosmic Campground approximately here and um, all the Leopold Wilderness area approximately right here. They're relatively unpolluted by um, uh, aircraft. Um, wouldn't say anything about Starlings yet. So um, did I set up anything else to illustrate? Uh, I did. So. Um, this is my telescope I've been taking for the past few years. I bought this telescope uh, approximately maybe six, seven, maybe eight years ago, specifically to take to New Mexico. So it's my favorite little portable scope, and this is a five inch or 125 or 127 millimeter um, Celestron um, C5 or, or um, SE, uh, whatever they call it. Anybody have these? Um, I've forgotten the name of their telescope offhand, but. Um, Anyway, it's a nice little Celestron scope. I settled on that size because that little tube assembly would fit into a little backpack that could easily carry on an aircraft. A little like, equatorial mount that you may have seen in another picture I have from um, a little manual German equatorial mount. Fits into um, carry-on baggage, or I should say uh, stow-on baggage. Um, that can weigh as much as it wants to and it's not really a problem. You pack it up with some clothing and camping gear and it fits really well. But this packs into a little backpack. Um, so Celestron Nexstar is the word I was trying to think of. Um, so some of you may have the Celestron Nexstar telescope. Quite a nice little telescope. Um, uh, the only slight disadvantage around here of a Schmidt-Cassegrain is you need a pretty good dew cap or good dew heating, but 
the U.S. never been a problem in New Mexico. It's a very dry desert area. I never have had a problem, never needed a new cap. I uh, just have some extra brackets on here for a finder. You see this um, sort of junky looking hose clamp. It's just holding on a, a Telrad uh, finder base um, that I use. Um, otherwise, it's sitting on a mount that I... Anyway, a bunch of details there, but I thought I'd show you my little telescope since it was actually in a previous picture. So I settled on taking this telescope uh, with me to New Mexico and um, I just love to take that one. Uh, actually, the first year I went, uh, first couple of years, I took a little 80 millimeter refractor. Um, I shouldn't call it little because it gave uh, spectacularly astounding images of some uh, things that were I thought were difficult deep, deep sky objects to see. And I saw them really easily through transparent skies. And um, if I didn't mention the altitude there, it's in the mountains, um, approximately six to 7,000 feet. Or you can convert it to meters if you like, but um, it's fairly up, well up in the mountains, and it's fairly well up into dry sky. So, um, an 80 millimeter refractor did a really good job. Um, and so, um, uh, a couple of objects that Arnold pointed out were NGC 2244 and, and the Rosette Nebula. So, I have looked at the Rosette Nebula whenever I've gone in the evening. Uh, more recent years ago in the morning, um, that is to say, I drive up uh, in the early morning before sunrise. Um, uh, when the moon is around first quarter moon in the evening sky. <coughs> and so uh, the Rosnet Nebula is one uh, really nice test, little test object I've looked lo like, like looking at in the evening sky because part of it is visible and even without a filter. And the filter really enhances it. So it's always an interesting test uh, in really dark, transparent skies to see how much of the Rosnet Nebula I, I can see. And that little cluster in the middle that Arnold pointed out, NGC 2244, really glitters sparklingly bright. It's a really beautiful sight. Um, anyway, in recent years, I've been taking this little telescope, which does a great job as well. Um, and so our Arnold mentioned the um, antenna galaxy, so I think that's a pretty good... I haven't looked for it yet, but I should look for it with this little telescope next time I go to look at it in the morning sky, because in the f morning sky in you know, February, um, the area around Corvus to Virgo is rising up toward the meridian. So that might be an interesting test object. Um, so uh, that's the telescope I've been using. Uh, one little detail I wanted to point out, um, I think I pointed out that it's not always, I told you it's not always nice, clear, deep blue sky because it's occasionally uh, cloudy and blizzard, possibly. Uh, so another little hassle that's occurred uh, some years is forest fires. So this is an area that's been wrecked by forest fire. Uh, all quite natural, I think. Um, so um, fine, uh, forest fires occur naturally. It's a huge forested area. Um, it's occasionally pretty darn dry, and so um, forest fires can wreck your plans and block off highways and um, even if you're in the wrong area, uh, contribute smoke into the sky. But that hasn't happened to me yet because these occur mostly in springtime. I've gone mainly in the winter. So um, that's a slight little complication as well. So um, I think with that, um, I just, just put in a picture of leaving the forest. I'm always uh, sorry to leave, but um, um, I am purpose of the picture is I am leaving it, so I'm finished off with um, I've, um, one quick summary, and all I could find to summarize was to say that uh, I think it's a fantastic sight for me to see really clear, natural, transparent night skies. So, thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Frank. Any questions? No questions for Frank? All right, good. Thanks for sharing your travels with us, Frank. Okay. Very good. Uh, and our
I, I so agree with Frank about photographs don't convey the wonder of observing. I, I so love uh, doing photography, etc. but I also love just looking and turning around and just soaking up the, the gloriousness of our, of our sky. And uh, I had a similar experience, and I want to share it with you, and then I'll relate what this is to astronomy. Um, Montreal has a Van Gogh exhibit, and they advertise themselves as, um, you know, imagined art. And uh, they have a bunch of uh, 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 displays coming in with text, and it was really dark, so I didn't get a good photo. And then you go into this room. And it's maybe the size of a hockey arena or a, uh, a warehouse. And you've got all these screens around the outside. Now, let's see if I can get the right projection. So you have screens around the outside. They have different cameras that project down. Sometimes they projected the same image. Sometimes they projected different ones. Um, and it was just such a magical experience. And I felt so part of it. And uh, the people there just stood and watched. It was a 30-minute show, and I stayed for three of them. Um, there was a painting on the floor. And you can see the actual screens. And then there's a close-up of some kids uh, near the screen. And these hung down. Uh, up above, they had projectors going down in different angles. And they had to change the picture, because if they just shone a regular picture straight down, it would be distorted. So they had to uh, correct for that. Uh, they had pretty good projectors. By the way, I took all these with my cell phone in the dark. and. Uh, they had to include the uh, probably Van Gogh's favorite painting or most famous painting, I don't know, Starry Night. Now, I am showing this to you partially because I strongly recommend going to Montreal and seeing it. It was such a, a wonderful experience. And also, you said you needed one more person, uh, one more presentation. But I think this could be done to promote astronomy. If uh, somebody could get some money, this is not a cheat exhibit, but they could make something with a bunch of astronomy images, um, maybe have uh, the sky all the way around, I don't know. It could be taken to different towns and shown in um, uh, gymnasiums or whatever, I don't know. But I think it could be a wonderful way to present uh, what astronomy, the experience we ex have when we are outside, especially by ourselves in the night sky. And um, I just present it, and if somebody's interested, I think it would make a wonderful project and probably could get some money from the government to do. So thank you very much. All right, short and sweet, Ron. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, indeed, it'd be amazing to have a 360-degree view of this nice guy uh, set up like that. Any questions? Is it still um, it's a bit still okay, they originally announced it was going to end, uh, uh, I think it goes to the end of March now in Montreal. Uh, this company has another art gallery in Toronto, and I went down and visited it about a week ago, and I saw their art here, and then I said it would be great to have it here, and then I got an email back that there's no plans to run this exhibit here. It's going to Quebec City, but I said there are six million people around Toronto, and I think many would, would want to go. It's just such an experience to be part of it. They had beautiful classical music going with the different... Uh, the different art, and uh, it was quite a quite a show. So, uh, I think it's the end of March. If you Google Van Gogh Montreal, you'll get you'll get the details. Then a, a, a planetarium. Um, I wasn't quite sure why it's different, but there's something about a planetarium where I'm in a seat, and the experience is thrown at me. But there's something about standing and being in the middle of it. It just felt different to me. Now, ideally, we have a planetarium in Peterborough and Oshawa and uh, Hamilton and maybe even Toronto. But the reality is, other than uh, a dome that is uh, air supported, uh, we're not going to get planetariums everywhere. And to me, this could be brought to 
uh, a community and at least for me and I hope somebody else tries it really worthwhile a trip to Montreal um, and there's something else there if anybody wants to go I'll recommend as well um, uh, it just felt like I was immersed uh, I think it was something like 20 bucks and I paid 15 bucks for parking okay. something like that just wondering if it's yeah. financially feasible and yeah that's yeah it's standard. right by the Lachine Canal yeah Anyway, enjoy, and if somebody wants a project, I think uh, money could be attained from the government, and I think it would really work. Thank you. Okay, well, just to finish off, let's take a look at what's going on over the next uh, few weeks. Our next meeting is in two weeks' time on 12th of February. Uh, it's a lecture meeting, and our speaker that evening is Richard Block, who some of you may remember uh, was a visitor here uh, back in 2014 when we uh, had the pleasure of uh, presenting him with the RASC Toronto Center Gold Medal. Uh, he was the gold medalist from the York University, and uh, he went on to uh, graduate school. He's now enrolled as a PhD student at York University, and he will be speaking about time. In four weeks' time, we have our next uh, recreational astronomy night. Uh, Andy Beaton will be doing the sky this month. Uh, Jerry Villa will be talking about Johannes Kepler, and I'm told that there's one more slot open that uh, uh, Paul would like to fill for that evening. So if you do have a project or something you'd like to talk about, uh, there's your chance. Uh, solar observing, uh, supposed to be uh, on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, weather permitting, although I must say the weather forecast for the next uh, four or five days is not as exactly the best. So it may be that we'll have to go to the uh, fallback, uh, uh, what do we call it, cloud date? Uh, the following Saturday, um, February the 8th. But uh, that'll be Sean's job to let us know about that, either late Friday or first thing Saturday. Other observing, well, we've got the group out at uh, Glen Forest, is it tonight? Uh, sort of doing a, uh, an impromptu uh, uh, dark sky night. Uh, and then next uh, uh, session that we will have for dark sky star party is the first clear night on the week of the 24th of February. Uh, the next city star party, which is held at Bayview Village Park, will be on the first clear night on the week of uh, 2nd to 5th March. Okay. Uh, that's history. We'll go on. Uh, apparently that was quite a well-attended event and uh, very successful. Uh, we also have another outreach event on um, uh, Saturday evening scheduled, uh, and that is our evening stargazing at closing hours at the Science Center. Uh, there is no cloud date for this, so it'll either go on Saturday night or not at all and we will have a, an announcement of that uh, by mid-afternoon on Saturday. Okay, uh, just a reminder that we always are in need of new volunteers to help out with uh, a lot of our uh, programs, and Blake Nancaro is the person who is coordinating 
uh, volunteers with our various activities. Uh, and you can contact him through volunteer at rasto.ca if you are interested in helping out. Uh, he did uh, give an example of uh, some of the volunteers that we do need to help out with uh, the uh, dark uh, uh, sky and city star parties. So uh, with these, uh, we've got uh, people who could help out perhaps with planning uh, uh, who is going to be there and uh, help out with various activities, uh, either facilitators, uh, uh, somebody uh, to maybe uh, do some photo documentation, other people to help uh, set up things and uh, make sure that uh, the people who are running the telescopes have some uh, assistance and uh, relief uh, while doing things. So again, uh, this is the kind of thing that um, we do need help with uh, from time to time. Okay, uh, one of the benefits of membership, of course, is the um, Dark Sky Observatory, the uh, EC Carr Astronomical Observatory near Collingwood. And uh, just a reminder that uh, the uh, winter uh, access rules are in effect now. Uh, we don't have much snow on the ground here, but there is snow up there. And uh, so uh, you do need to walk into the site. And uh, also remember that uh, while there is no supervisor there, uh, the Sioux Laura Observatory is available for imaging, and uh, you can book that when you book your uh, uh, space at the uh, Carr Observatory uh, through the winter months. Another benefit is the telescope loan program. We have a couple of the uh, program managers uh, here tonight. And uh, just a uh, reminder that we do have a, a wide variety of instruments that are available for uh, your use. And finally, the meeting after the meeting at the Granite Brew Pub down at Eglinton and Mount Pleasant. And a few of us will be there uh, after the meeting ends tonight. So that's it for the next couple of weeks. We'll see you. Uh, at the next meeting. Oh, one last uh, announcement. Charmaine. Yep. So I would like to talk about the orientation program for new members. It's called First Light. So um, any new member here or some in YouTube land. Uh, so we'll be holding the First Light orientation program starting from February 26th. March 11 and March 25. This is an orientation program for new members and we'll be posting the announcement or all the other information, how to sign up, etc., on our website. Also, we'll be sending out invitations to new members who signed up all of 2019 until now and to look for those information. And if you know new members that when you are um, helping at the star parties, please let them know to look out for that and um, uh, to contact me or Kirsty Mima, she's right there. We are coordinating this um, yearly annual new members orientation program. Thank you. Thanks, Ramin. Uh, also, uh, Sean reminds me that we do have a few last 2020 observers calendars available for sale if anybody's interested. More to go. And this is the, our last night for selling. Yep, that's right, this last night. Okay, and with that, have a safe trip home. We'll see you in a couple of weeks.